Hello, everyone. We're trying demo. Let's figure out if it's better than Zoom. And today we will discuss uh, Gaussian processes and how to use them, how to understand the hyperparameters, in what you can do them with them in general. And there will be quite a few examples that I feel should be very motivating to study them more. If you have any questions, then you can go to public chat and try typing your message. I don't feel like I will be very responsive during the presentation because I'll need to go back and forth to check the message present. And uh, I don't hear any notifications about new messages. So from time to time, I will go to chat and see if there are any questions. Um, so let's start. We will begin with some uh, really basic things concerning Gaussian processes. Uh, we will need some formulas, to be honest, to understand what is going on. So forgive me for putting uh, large equations on some slides. And then we will go to a more interesting part about hyperparameters and how to use them and how to understand them in real life situations. And after that, uh, we should have time left for uh, for some toy examples and the real world example with a coding session. I really hope we will make it in time uh, because I hope we will make it. We should. Okay. So Gaussian processes are treated as non-parametric methods in uh, Bayesian analysis. And the reason they're non-parametric is because uh, the parameters are implicit. And what you treat uh, is, as a prior, is, a function sp is function space. And this function space is also something that uh, has to be really discussed what is this function space, how to think about it. And you can think of uh, function space as something that depends on some input values. So if you have age variable, it should be something that depends on age, either a probability to see an event or uh, maybe height depends on uh, your age, or it can be treated as a time series function, or time dependent function, where your input variable is time and output variable is effect or customers seen on this particular day, or maybe some special function that depends on coordinates. Uh, in more complicated cases, that input is arbitrary, like can be a uh, taken from data frame and you figure out if uh, what are the connections between the output value and uh, your input. And what you say about this function is whether it is volatile as a change quickly uh, depending on the input variable change. Uh, you also decide if your desired function is uh, variable enough, so which uh, values can it take, whether it lies within, let's say, from minus 1 to 10, or if it is positive. So you put something to make more structure. You can also say that your function is periodic, which is very helpful for time series. And it will extrapolate uh, in future, taking care about this periodic structure. 
So these assumptions may seem very informal. Like we explain them like in hand wavy way, but in principle they can be represented with so-called kernels. Other than Gaussian processes, there exist many non-parametric methods that uh, also are very powerful and sometimes even complement Gaussian processes in analysis. And some examples are uh, Dirichlet processes, Bayesian, additive regression trees, uh, also referred as BART, and many others. And yeah, I promised to put some formulas on slide. And Gaussian processes are represented uh, with those symbols in papers, in blog posts. So these beautiful GP letters represent a Gaussian process. And a GP has a mean function and kernel function as inputs. And these kind of uh, functions depend on input variables that are usually referred as x. The output variable is represented as y, and usually it lies in uh, real space. And input variable is in vector space with dimensionality n. All right. So we're checking the note, we're checking the chat, so nothing happens. Good. If you have any questions, then just post and post them in chat and uh, I'll take care of it. But this Gaussian process is nothing but a big, a huge normal distribution. And when you expand those mean functions and kernel functions, uh, they decompose into mean vector and covariance matrix. And a covariance matrix will be composed of uh, atomic applications of this kernel function. And it will compare X and X prime uh, with all coordinates. Uh, throughout the whole input vector. So if you if you have many input points that all lie in this vector space, it will be a matrix of inputs. And the whole matrix is compared uh, everything to everything. So this kernel gives us a matrix, which is positive definite. Uh, obviously, this should be a hard requirement on kernel functions. Otherwise, uh, it would be something wrong with our normal distribution. And bin vector can be really arbitrary. And then it's all put in, into normal distribution. And that's how our output values are supposed to be sampled. And they follow this normal distribution. As you can see, uh, besides that, we have our input output pairs to be supposedly independent. Uh, because they follow this huge normal distribution with this covariance matrix, these input output pairs depend on each other. So the first input will be dependent on 10th input or any other input. So they are all correlated for these output values wise. And that's how this complicated structure of the Gaussian process really draws these lines that you may have seen in internet or pictures. We will also uh, see that in, in a few slides. As for mean function, 
It can be a linear regression. It can be a constant. It can be anything, uh, anything else. You can put the any function you like. And for kernels, uh, there can be there can be transformations. There can be compositions of different kernels that that all give give us positive definite matrices. The simplest possible kernel that is used in Gaussian processes is RPF, a radial basis function. This is nothing but taking the quadratic distance, dividing by length scale, and outping a scale. So the, in a nutshell, this kernel depends on distance between two inputs. If inputs are close together, then they are treated similar. If they are very far from each other, then they are treated uh, as different. They are treated different, and they don't really depend on each other. And depending on length scale, this so-called closeness may be different. And this is exactly the parameter that will tell uh, about uh, volatility of our function. So if, if it changes quickly, when our input values change. If length scale is huge, then our function doesn't change quickly. If we sort our input variables and let's say they lie on on a uniform interval from 0 to 2, then those inputs that are close together are similar. Those that are far away, that they are not similar. A uh, little bit more about kernels, uh, which is uh, crucial for practical applications, is mathematics about kernels. And we will really need it when we define some complicated relations between input and output variables. So kernels can be summed together. They can be multiplied together and with different coefficients. A sum of two kernels is a valid kernel, uh, given the coefficients are positive. And the product of two kernels is also a valid kernel, given the given powers are also uh, positive. If we don't need complicated structure, then we can just assume that there is a single kernel that is multiplied by sigma. And sigma is like a normal distribution. The larger, the, the larger is sigma. Actually, this, uh, there should be sigma squared, not just sigma. Uh, so the more volatile is our function. And we will use the summation property with epsilon, with a constant kernel. And this constant uh, epsilon is, uh, you can treat it as observational noise. So there, you can observe a smooth function, but the actual output values will be scattered nearby. And, to, and length scale. So this is also one of the main hyperparameters of uh, most of kernel functions. So let's understand the length scale a little bit better. So I told you that length scale is how quickly our function changes. And here's the plot with uh, three uh, same 
Gaussian processes, samples from Gaussian processes, but with length scale being different. The blue line is the Gaussian process with the smallest length scale out of three. And the green, the green one is, uh, is the one with the largest length scale. As you can see, the blue line is very volatile. So we go a little bit and our function changes really real quickly. The length scale is uh, the hyperparameter that uh, is really hard to infer, but is the one that we can uh, talk and elaborate really a lot. And there is often a good idea about what the length scale could be like. If you think of maybe time series, then your length scale will be on the time scale. If you think about ages, uh, age, then the length scale will be in terms of years. If your Gaussian process is on the spatial dimension, then spatial distance is exactly the values that uh, you use to measure this length scale. So it can be kilometers, years, minutes, anything. And usually you can, when you think more about it, then you have an idea about uh, whether the effect should be uh, very different given you go away for one kilometer or maybe 1000 kilometers. So that gives you a lot of information about the length scale. If you don't have an idea about the length scale, then it can lead you to uh, bad identification of uh, length scale issues. So it, it is really hard to infer, but usually easier to inform. Sometimes you may leave it just fixed if you don't have intention to change that and you have a good idea about uh, the variability of your effect size across the dimension. So let's say we have an example where we have a time dimension and we have missing values in quarters and we need to interpolate them in time. What we can do is uh, fitting a Gaussian process to data with missing values. So we're going to interpolate it and our observed variables will be year-to-year uh, -year observations or quarter-to-quarter -quarter observations. And in order to have more granularity, we will interpolate. But actually, the length scale is something that we can uh, really say a lot about. So the length scale of one year will, would be something that makes sense for macroeconomics because of, uh, from year to year, we expect a lot of changes in development, in economic situation. So we can uh, easily say that one year is enough for significant changes. Or if it is more conservative, then we can also say five years is enough for a big change. But a rule of thumb about using the length scale parameter is being able to say that in X years, kilometers, I expect a big change. And the closer you to, uh, the smaller you think about it, uh, pick the smallest that you can uh, safely say in this sentence. And it will help you to take into account uh, the missing 
uh, all the missing val uh, of values and take into account all the non-missing neighboring observations. So let's go to the next one and it will be the amplitude. Again, this should be sigma squared. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, because no, why sigma squared? I did mention it. So sigma squared would be because we uh, really act on variances. And those kernel functions on the uh, this the kernel function on the diagonal uh, will, would be the, our variance and for variances we use sigma squared so that's why the sigma should be squared when you define your Gaussian process don't forget that alpha would be a multiplier for variance and uh, covariance So this amplitude, uh, sigma squared, would define how big our changes in, term, in terms of output values. So if we measure GDP, gross domestic product, it would be the variability of, uh, of the domestic product. If it is changes in GDP, it would be the magnitude of, uh, of the changes. If we measure height, and then it will be variability of height, not input variables. It would be the variability of output. And the larger is sigma, the more variable we expect, the more magnitude we put into output. But you can see that uh, they're not that volatile in terms of how our input values change. We still we can still see that sometimes the change is quite big when we change the input variable, but if we look in uh, through the lens of the amplitude, this is an expected uh, scale of changes, and for for the blue line, even a small change compared to the green line would be already considered a significant change given the given they have the same length scale uh, i see a question uh, is it a fair assumption the larger the length scale ma magnitude the smoother the y output Yes, it is a fair assumption that the larger the length scale, the smoother is the function is. If the length scale is uh, infinity, then we'll just draw that straight line. If the length scale is close to zero, we will have the complete mess on the plot. Right. And here we go with the white noise. As so for white noise, uh, whatever we can have, the length scale, the amplitude, it would be the variability of our output values, output of maybe observations or realizations of the Gaussian process around this line that you've seen on the previous plot. So here the variability of the output is zero. And that's why we see it as, as, as line. But when we have non-zero epsilon, we will have scatter plot, not just line plot. And you won't be able to draw a smooth line uh, through all these dots. It will be messing. Uh, the only thing you can think of is smooth version, uh, smooth win windowed function of observations and 
it is expected that if you have huge epsilon compared to sigma, then you won't be possible, you won't be able to infer the kernel parameters because noise just dominates. If we have huge sig epsilon, it, all our observations could be just uh, a matter of huge noise. So usually we want our epsilon to be as small as possible. So the observational noise. Putting it all together, we can look at our RBF kernel in a, under the microscope. We'll have the length scale and it appears in the denominator uh, below the distance. Our amplitude is the multiplier of the exponent and epsilon is added to this kernel. So we use the summing rule for kernels. We have a multiplier and a summation. We can actually put this length scale inside, inside our distance function and just rescale input value, values. Nothing would actually change. Sometimes it is uh, more efficient to rescale input values uh, for the sake of uh, computational efficiency. But usually you don't really care about it. Everything is uh, either very slow or very fast. Uh, we, will dis we will discuss that on the coding session. There are various types of kernels. Uh, some of them are stationary and stationary means that uh, with a hand wavy explanation, uh, we say that when I extrapolate, I go back to, to prior and where prior it is something that is near the mean function with some, with some noise. Uh, actually, the normal, normal distribution, correlated normal distribution in extrapolation. So we could have arbitrary well-behaved function through our inputs when values are smaller than zero, and it will extrapolate like this. So it won't go to infinities. When we have periodic or circular fun or kernel, then we say that things are similar over time and repeat themselves. And if we look at the plot, uh, there are lines that draw the periods one by one. And you, as you can see, the pattern is repeated one to one through all the periods. And periods may be very, very complicated, but they have this strong property to repeat. When we have linear or polynomial kernel, we don't expect any stationarity. And we expect that when we extrapolate, uh, it will behave like either linear function or polynomial function. And this one might go to infinities. Um, there is one example in PIMC examples where you can see all the combinations of these kernels. When we combine kernels together, let's say we have exponential kernel and periodic. What we say 
is that we still have this periodic structure that things can uh, change uh, periodically. So the, the pattern is repeated over time, but there can be uh, structural structural change through time. And here is the summation of exponential and periodic. So there is a trend that behaves like uh, a regular Gaussian process that you that is stationary, but the oscillation around this long term trend is periodic. And this pattern very much similar to business cycles or macroeconomic uh, uh, quantities. Patterns you usually repeat uh, from year to year, but within year they have a periodic uh, oscillation, uh, which is very similar from year to year. If we combine two periodic kernels, what we actually say is uh, we have a pattern that repeats uh, within. The, we have a pattern that one of them may be within one year, and another pattern may be within uh, ten years, or months, or quarters. And there will be granularity of this periodic structure. And uh, this periodicity may be then yearly, monthly, weekly, uh, and whatever you like, whatever you like it to be. And you can really infer what are the patterns and uh, under every granularity with uh, Bayesian analysis. So decomposing this uh, sum of periodic kernels. And you don't need to combine just periodic and periodic, periodic and uh, stationary. You can combine any of them. They all will give you valid, uh, valid kernel. You just to need make sure that you understand what the combination uh, really means. And here, uh, uh, here we could expect uh, climate change data, for example, increasing uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, they're expected to grow over time, but they still have this periodic structure uh, within year. So we, it can be easily be a sum of linear and periodic kernel. And here we understand one is kernel represents trend, another one represents uh, yearly uh, periodicity. Uh, to sum up, kernels really represent what you think about uh, your dependency, uh, how input depend, how output depends on input, and in what way it is structured. Does it act like periodic? thing uh, does it change quickly and when you put this knowledge into kernels you can really estimate the variability of your data uh, volatility and everything else and you can in interpret the length scale uh, sigmas epsilon and make predictions for new data And it is really fair to say that Gaussian processes is uh, like a Swiss knife in Bayesian analysis. I've worked with many projects, uh, real world applications, and each time in many, in many cases, Gaussian process was very helpful to represent a complicated dependency. Uh, whether it be a changing parameter over time, 
or a time series or some special dependency. It has always sparked some real novel ideas about how to think about the problem. And simplest possible examples like eight schools can be viewed under different lens when we think about uh, schools being scattered on on map. Let's imagine we know the coordinates of those schools and plot them on, on a 2D plot. We measured the score uh, of students, like let's say students take exam and we plot their scores uh, by color and the brighter the color, the higher the score. And we treat that uh, our schools, if they're close together, then uh, students should be uh, same educated. If schools are far apart, then we don't really know if there's, if students are similar. So we can only say that uh, close together schools should have same performant students. And on two-dimensional space, Gaussian process will, will look like not a line, uh, but a surface. And this surface would be uh, as smooth as you allow it, it to be with length scale. So inferring the length scale would be inferring the volatility of the surface. And in traditional example, these eight schools uh, were started with like a hierarchy and the hierarchy case study. And we can reframe that and, and say that our hierarchy is spatial. Oh, I read a lot of questions. Mm, so there is a question. But the problem arises with high dimension problems that we cannot visualize choosing length scale or choosing the right kernel combination kernels. Mm. You seem to chat together. Oh, actually, it doesn't seem like a question. Let me just continue. So we have our Gaussian process spatial hierarchy, which sounds super fancy. How would we implement that? Traditionally, we have our model written in either centered or non-centered way. So we have mean that follows normal distribution. We have tau, the variability of our population. And we have uh, theters, which are mean scores that define uh, define the uh, normal distribution that our observations follow. And in this toy example, uh, sigma is uh, treated to be known, so we uh, safely ignore that. With the Gaussian process, uh, we should use uh, non-centered parameterization because uh, that's uh, the easiest one to reparameterize. And in non-centered parameterization, we have a sigma bar we follow normal standard normal distribution, and and this 
standard normal distribution is independent for every observation, right? And in a new example with spatial hierarchy, our theta bar will follow Gaussian process that is now dependent on spatial coordinates. And then we reparameterize just as before. And we have the same likelihood as a non-centered example. So the only change, to be honest, is this standard normal distribution changed to Gaussian process. And that's it. And now you have special hierarchy. Uh, if you haven't been to the lecture that explains hierarchical linear regressions, then in a nutshell, why this non-standard parameterization is used in the, uh, in the first place is because it helps with geometry issues and uh, mass sampler is easier to work with uh, non-standard parameterization. Or not always, but in most cases. Right. After we estimate our A schools example, we can extrapolate everything to every coordinate. So we can predict expected scores of new schools for every other coordinate. So instead of all schools being independent and uh, that would only allow us to make the prediction for new school as uh, treating it as totally independent from other schools. Now we can make a prediction for new school and taking into account uh, the special coordinate of this new school. So if we were to decide where to build a new school that will give us uh, the most brilliant students, we will choose the one that in the bright area. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, you can ask them in chat. And this uh, lecture is getting close to our coding session. If you don't have any questions, we can continue with coding and we will study the poll data. Right. Uh, let's now go to do some coding. Uh, do you see the screen yes. well? Good. So I've prepared you actually a real world example with poll, with poll data where Gaussian processes are very useful. I will start by inputting all the necessary libraries. So SciPy, NumPy, whatever we need. And of course, PyMC. And don't forget inputting PyMC when you do Bayesian analysis. Um, and here is the plotting function that is specially prepared for this example. 
that will make us just awesome plots. And the demo data. I took this data from a questionnaire that was repeated uh, across years in Russia, studying the demographic situation. Uh, if somebody knows RLMS database, and here is the one single question that I found uh, uh, pretty interesting to look at. And this question meant, uh, did you swim at least 20, 12 times in the last 12 months? So it, if people respond with yes, that means that we went to a swimming pool, or went to, to the seashore to get some swimming. And if they did that, we will see a line, we will see a dot on this plot. So people respond yes. So there are quite a lot of dots uh, with, a no, with no response and quite a few with yes response. And yes response appears uh, in, in, seems to appear between ages uh, 15 and 18. So elderly people go swimming, but to some extent. It feels natural to use binomial distribution for count date for for this questionnaire and we will we would need to uh, figure out not only how frequently people go to swimming pool or seashore but also is it dependent on age on and in what way does it depend on age let's first summarize our data getting counts and successful events. The counts would be individual responses, responses per age. And let's plot it and see how many responses we have and given specific age. Well, that doesn't seem to be well balanced. We have a lot of responses in need age and very few responses uh, for elderly people. So the real power, superpower of Bayesian analysis is being able to take this unbalanced data set and weight it properly to give uh, a good estimate. We could also have, have a gap. Oh, let's even imagine we have a gap for some of the, some age. Let's say we didn't get much of the, of the responses for ages. Uh, let's drop, let's totally drop some ages. There is 103 um, diff possible choices for age. Let's choose just 70. So these are the ages that we want to only observe. And the missing ones would be unobserved.
where we're doing that for counts and for su success events. Mm -hmm. Date gets messed up. Let's use Scatter. All right. So we see some dots just disappeared. Um, there is an empty model. Let's figure out our model for this questionnaire. So the first thing, thing to start is to think about our mean. What should be the mean function? And I think it, it really makes sense to have zero mean because, well, after if we extrapolate to infinity, I would expect that people don't really go to swimming pool after 100 years and, 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 and more. So our mean would be very, very close to zero. Since we have uh, to estimate probabilities, we need to deal with uh, modeling probabilities. And usually it is done in logit space. And there is no real choice otherwise using logit space. So we put our mean to, to the logit space. That would be the constant mean function for the Gaussian process. And then the length scale. That would be interpreted as uh, some habit persistence thing. I heard that uh, three years, something that makes sense for good habit to survive after events. If you have other ideas, then it may be some different value. And let's say it's somewhat around four years, plus minus one. Since it is a positive value, let's use gamma. We also need variability. And just for variability, I don't have idea about how would it look at how would it look in in the logit space. So I put a really non-informative prior there. Let's use half question and see how it goes. And that allows us to specify a kernel. And we will use just a standard one. Everything that relates to Gaussian processes in PyMC can be accessed as pm.gp.something. For covariance, it would be .cov. Let's use exponential quadratic kernel. So it is the same as uh, RBF, but with distance squared.
So we need input dimensionality. So we only have one. That's our age. So length scale is our habit length scale. Let's put it there. And we need our amplitude as a multiplier. Right. So we are ready to specify our Gaussian process. Hmm. I said that the Gaussian process can be either fast or you can suffer from it being extremely slow. Let's not suffer. Let's choose the, the one that is fast from the very beginning. And in one of the latest PyMC releases, uh, Bill implemented HSGP Gaussian process. I will talk a, li uh, a little bit more about HSGP Gaussian process in the next lecture, but let's take it for granted that HSGP is something that is useful for continuous data. That is for time on time series that is defined on some time series or on some spatial data. For HSGP, we need a number of approximators. Let's say we we use 30 approximators, 30 basis functions. And we also need uh, a parameter C about extrapolation length. Let's say we don't extrapolate more than by 20%. That would give us the value of 1.2. Now we define mean function and it would be pm dot e dot mean constant. And we use mean log it. Let me check if we, if I have any questions. Why is yes, there are some questions. Why then scale fun is length scale a function and not just float? It is actually float, it just constant function. Whatever h is, it will output us zero probability. Amplitude. Yes, let's make it squared. You're right. Amplitude squared. Thank you. Great. Let's, let's go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good. So what we do next is we define all our possible choices for every age, including the missing ones. And to do that with uh, gp.prior. There is also a different method prior linearized, but if you know what you're doing, you can do with linearized but you, you will, I would call you magician. If you're not magician, I use prior. Uh, otherwise, but magicians, linearized will give you the possibility to have multi-output Gaussian process and something really fancy. We don't need fancy, that fancy stuff here. So we call our new random variable as log it p and we need some inputs and our inputs are 
the whole range of pages and we make it a column. Right. Good. But it's but not all ages are present in in the data set. We just randomly dropped something for for the sake of curiosity. We need to select only those who uh, which are which we observe. And let's also uh, have a deterministic variable. that we call P. We pass it through sigmoid. Oh, let's use, let's also use beams. Beams H. Because we define these values for all possible ages. Mm -hmm. Oh, we forgot a cough function. That's useful. It's just to figure out if something compiles. And we, we have only the generative process for for our probabilities and we can already sample uh, prior predictives and see how our function looks like and I actually don't really like this uh, prior predictive it feels like amplitude is too much like really too much Let's instead of half Cauchy use just half normal. It does seem low. Is it all correct? Looks better. Ah, indeed. Well, uh, mean is very low that's why we see that it is very close to zero that is expected from our prior uh, and half normal distribution doesn't allow the probability uh, to go really above and those red lines are some of the one of possible choices of how would this distribution of our swimmers look like. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't expect that the whole population goes swimming every year. So the prior predictive looks somewhat okay. So. If, it, if the probability is one, that means that the whole country goes swimming. And that is insane. I don't believe that. So let's keep that amplitude as it is now. Uh, let's keep mean as it is now and go ahead with, with observed. There was a question on 
uh, in the chat. Yeah, no, I didn't forget uh, P equals to deterministic because it will just record it just for bookkeeping. And I don't really need this P because I will use the logit parameterization of NML. Right. Let's slice our logit P with only the values that we use for observed. And it would be counts index. And we need to make sure that we don't miss anything here. So we need index. So every index should be, every H should be there. It starts from zero. It ends with 102 and the end it is of length 103. That indeed means that we have all possible edges present in our observed data set. Otherwise, it would be slightly more complicated. We would need to take care of missing edges in the very beginning. But right now, our index indeed represents uh, the possible, the index that we need to take uh, from our logit p vector. Um, actually, I make things a little, little bit more complicated than it than should be. We actually came to the best type int. Yeah. Oh, even if we have missing edges in the very beginning, they would be reflected in this index already. And that is that is okay. So nothing to worry about. That's fine. Let's make sure that it is what we expect. So it, they are all integers, age, yes, 17, right. Good. So the only thing is to have the observed value. We use the we use binomial. And for binomial, we need the logit parameterization. Logit P is this one. We need and that accounts, right? And our observed values is the success variable. Well, I don't specify beams here because uh, something could be missing. We don't really care about this, this dim. Something obviously goes wrong. Let's find out. Can't convert me pandas index to tensor variable. Oh, that's unfortunate. Let's use values. Okay. Seems to be better now. All right. That's how it looks like right now. We have our amplitude, we have our length scale of habits, we have the supplementary thing from HSGP. We predict all the probabilities and observe something. 
let's sample prior predictive once again. Look at our probability. Looks fine. And let's and let's use yet another fancy sampler, not pi. NotPy, for those who don't know, is the PyMC sampler, which is written in Rust. Well, samples, we can go visit NotPy web page. So NotPy is written by Adrian, one of the PyMC developers, and it is very very efficient on cpu in order to use pymc model it converts uh, the computational graph to number and then samples using uh, c implement uh, rust implementation of mass with very advanced uh, adaptation metrics let's go back to our example it's, it takes only two seconds to sample. Let's, <laughs> I don't believe it. Let's try it once more. It compiles longer than it samples, you see? With few divergences, which uh, we don't have time to debug, but in principle, we should debug this. Oh, I think that something is really off. I actually had a very nice plot. Had a very nice plot with no missing values. Mm. I bet we need to debug this anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the goal was to predict all the missing values. Mm -hmm. oh. Something is off. The prior predictive is what I don't like. I really don't like my prior predictive. Those spikes are insane. And the probability is dramatic. Somewhat, somewhat better. Let's put some prior on. Oh, and let's let's not put prior there because well, it's something that we know for sure. It shouldn't be changed.
Looks okay, but uh, this land scale is sounds seems the land scale actually seems to be quite small. You see that if you go into the swimming pool at age twenty five, then you swim for some time, but and never swim in future sounds weird let's increase length scale Let's try this. Could it be the indexing that is wrong? It's very, very off. Of curiosity, let's put the put prior here. I hope that I don't believe that will fix the issue. Oh, but how would it look like under this prior? Something is wrong here, then it's definitely messed up. Oh. Well, it looks like it, it, it indeed looks like as I expected. And the reason why I didn't want to specify the prior for mean was exactly this. Uh, because when we go closer to ages that don't have a lot of data close to age 100 then our prior expectation should be that they don't go to a swimming pool but since we have uh, 
prior that doesn't enforce this, we see that spike. Um, this is another model, and they didn't uh, wish I tried it before the webinar. And it didn't put uh, quadratic values here. Let's try this model as well. It is the same, but the magnitude has changed and slightly more. Except, well, what is the length scale of uh, habits? Uh, I didn't look at this before. I'm also curious. Bit length scale. Hmm. Not that different from prior expectation. In principle, this model should be the same. And uh, this model was tested without missing values. And it could be the missing values that uh, made all this hustle. Or could be some weird typo. Let's find it out. This is the ideal picture that I was looking for. And this ideal picture is having uh, zeros in, li in both limits and some uncertain estimate for intermediate values uh, where we have missings. Not sure, but scatter plot will be cool. So that's it. I think that uh, the thing that caused the divergences and weird behavior was in the magnitude and length scale combined. Otherwise, the model is exactly the same. Ooh. If you have questions, you can ask them in the chat. Otherwise, we are in time. And I, of course, will share all the materials. All right, I think we can stop the recording.